to your neighbours, to your family who's saying, life doesn't make sense. Something has happened over the last couple of years in COVID and more and more people are just beginning to realise that life as normal isn't right. More and more people are beginning to become open and think, well, I was doing this for so long and I was carrying on, on as normal and everything was fine, but COVID hit and all of a sudden I realised what I didn't have. I realised how empty my life was. And that is true not just for non-Christians, it's also true for some Christians as well, folks. Are you ready to share with them the hope that you have? On our holiday, each morning I would head down to the beach and just walk along the seafront. And each morning there was a man there with a metal detector. A man there, he was, at times he was down on his knees trying to dig something out from the sand that had beeped on his metal detector. He was scanning the sand for something, looking for that diamond ring, looking for a while, looking for maybe some notes, looking for something that someone had left behind. And I want to say, I think that was something serious that God was perhaps saying to me, saying that people are looking. People are looking for answers today. People in your workplace, if they're not Christians, are looking for answers and they will be looking at you. People in your family who say that they don't know Jesus and say that they've got it all together are looking for answers and looking for hope. And I want to say, are we ready? Are we ready? 
I want to talk over the next coming weeks, over the summer period, about this, about pillars of our faith. You know, our faith is not built on small things, but it's built on pillars that have been developed over time, built on God's word. And some of those things are up there in the Bible, Jesus as our saviour, what the Bible says about humanity and sin, our commission as Christians, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, loads of different things. And those things that I put up there are Elim's core beliefs. They are Elim's core beliefs. Now, I, when I went for my interview to become a, 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 to become a minister in training, I had to read up about these different things, and they quizzed me as to about what I thought about them. So, so this is a little bit of a refresh, refresher course for me, if you like, over the few, next few weeks as I bring some of these things to you. But folks, what do we believe about the Bible? Is it is the Bible still true? A lot of people say it's irrelevant. Is, is, is the Holy Spirit still at work today? He, he was at work in, in the New Testament. Is, is he still at work today? The church, what's the purpose of the church? You know, church, oh, church numbers are going down. No, church, irrelevant. Oh, young people don't come to church. Oh, I'm going to smack someone when they tell me that. <laughs> Black hands. Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> I obviously need to go with my core beliefs. <laughs> But pillars, foundational truths, and we want to look this morning, so that we know as Christians what hope we have. I think it's good just to refresh in times which are uncertain, in secular society that tries to drift us away from God's word, tries to tell us that Christianity is irrelevant. We need to come back to the core things that we hold as important in our faith and in our church. I'll just put that verse up there again. Talk about pillars of the faith. This from Psalm 75. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. There's been a lot of shaking over the last two years. It's still going on. There's been a lot of quaking. It's still going on. But it's God who holds our pillars firm. So let me put that on the screen. Our core belief about the Bible. And I don't know if this is too heavy for you on a hot, stuffy Sunday morning. But this is what we believe. We believe the Bible as originally given to be without error, to be fully inspired, and infallible, the infallible word of God, and the supreme and final authority in all matters of faith and conduct. Someone say, Whew. Do you know what? Just talking about the Bible. It's a bit of information. The Bible is still the most translated book that has ever been written. It is still the most bought book ever. It's also the most burgled book because some people, for whatever reason, want to try and steal it. Maybe it's the pages, you know, maybe they're nice and thin and they've got another purpose. I couldn't imagine what that might be. But maybe they, they've got another purpose. It's the most bought, the most burned book. Did you realise that? No. The most burned book. People love to destroy it. It's the most burgled book. If you're anything, you're anything like me, I sometimes have a love-hate relationship with the Bible. One minute I think, oh, brilliant, yes, I understand it, I agree, I got it. Next day I read something else, I go, oh man, I'm not sure what I'm trying to live, live now. But our Bible, folks, is not just normal literature. Our Bible is not just works like Shakespeare wrote. Our Bible is not just another script that a normal human being has put together. Our Bible is the holy book. Not just the book, it is the holy book. Voltaire was a French atheist philosopher a couple of hundred years ago, and he said these words about the Bible. In a hundred years' time, it will be unknown and forgotten. He wrote that in a town in France. A hundred years later, the Bible Society went to his hometown, and because the Bible was spreading so much across France, they had to open an office in the town where he said those words. People say to me, they go, well, the Bible is not scientifically possible. You know, that, that is the thing going around. You know, well, we read the Bible and some of it is just not scientifically possible. And do you know, when these people say that to me, I have a response for them. I say, yeah, you're right. Some of the things in the 
Bible are not scientifically possible. It is not scientifically possible for a woman to become pregnant without a man. Mary did. We sing about it every Christmas. It is not scientifically impossible for the Red Sea to part into two and for an army to walk through it. It is not scientifically impossible for Jesus to be dead completely and raised to life again. It is not scientifically possible for Jesus to feed 5,000 people plus with just a few loaves and a few fishes. I believe that the Bible isn't scientifically possible, folks. But that's what makes it so true. I don't need scientific possibilities in my life, folks. It just proves that God is God. It proves that we have a supernatural, all-powerful, all-breaking, all-creating, all-knowing God. And that is the God of our Bible. The problem is, though, when people say that the Bible is not scientifically true, what they're really doing, where it's really leading to, is saying that I don't want to believe part of it. I hear some of it is all right, but there are other bits in it that, no, 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 I want to stay away from. No, 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 that could never happen. No, no, that's not right. There's a danger when we go down that road, folks. There's a danger when we say only parts of it are, are true and other parts of it aren't true. And the danger is that we're, we're worshipping our own self. Because we're choosing, picking and choosing from the Bible parts that we like and parts that we don't like. And when we do that, God is no longer God in our lives. We are our gods. We are in charge. God is no longer the supreme authority in our life, but we are. Because we pick and choose from his word what we think is right and what we like. Do you know what I've realised as well? About the Bible, folks, it's changed my life. I don't know about you, but it's changed my life. I can remember being at the lowest point in my life. Lowest point in my life completely. And reading from Isaiah 43, verse 18. It says this. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? And when I realised that, when I read that, I realised God wasn't done with me. I realised that my life was not coming to an end. I realised despite everything that had gone on, there was a hope and there was a future. And God brought me through that situation. The Bible has been real and has shaped my life. I just want to go on and look at a few of the things that, that as our core belief, what we believe the Bible is. We believe that the Bible is inspired. Not that the Bible is, is inspirational, although it is in part, it is inspirational to us. It, it does give us inspiration to, to live a godly and a, a holy life and live a life that is right before God. But it's not just inspiring, it has been inspired by God's Holy Spirit. The entire content of the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit and profitable for instruction. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is the written revelation of God. And you know what? It ceases to be just the writings of remarkable authors. It's not just the writings of people who've done brilliant things. It's the written revelation of God to you and to me. Now, the Bible has been put together on two levels. The people who wrote the Bible were ordinary folk. They were ordinary men like you and me. They wrote about um, historical events that had taken place. They wrote about the miracles that they had seen. They wrote prophecies about what was to come. They wrote poetry about their experience with God. They, they told of events and the mir miracles that they had witnessed with their very own eyes. It's written on an ordinary human level. But at the same time, it is also written on a completely different level. Because it was written with the, integrally by the sovereign operation of the Holy Spirit 
permeating through the whole process. So it is fully the word of a person, but it also is fully the word of God. Say, some, say to the person next to you, I'm going to need faith. <laughs> because it takes faith. It takes faith to believe these things. And also not just it's inspired, but the Bible as originally given to the writers, the Word of God. There are different translations of the Bible that they sort of put things slightly differently. They try and um, change the these and the thous to the you's and the me's and the he's and the she's. It puts it in contemporary language, which is absolutely fine. And I, what, I, what is incredible, I just let me put a slide up on the front. I, I came across a guy when I was doing religious studies. That's going back a long way. A long way. Religious studies. His name's Plato. Okay? I had never come across this guy until I was doing GCSE RE. And then all of a sudden, I didn't have to learn about God, I had to learn about Plato. Plato. And some people doubt the authenticity of the Bible. Well, when I realized all the writings about Plato, and this is taught as fact in our, in our universities, in our schools, in our lecture halls and whatever about Plato, it is that there is believed to be about 10 copies of the original manuscript that Plato wrote. And, and people take Plato's writing as read wrote about ideas about body, mind, and soul, and the separation of the body and the mind. And they just taught as fact. This is what he said. But there were only about 10 copies of his original writings. And those original writings were actually written 1,400 years after Plato wrote them. After the original manuscripts. You look at the Bible, and there are over 5,000 copies of the original manuscripts of the Bible that we get our modern translation from. And they weren't written 1,400 years after Plato's writing. Some of them were written just 50 years later. So we can take the Bible as having good, authentic information, reliable information in it when we compare other writings of the time or other things that we study from history. People say, well, what about the contradictions in the Bible? I'd like to say, what are you talking about? Often people who say they might be, con well, they're contradictions. The Bible says this, and on the other hand, it says this. We need to do something careful when we read the Bible. We need to have what's called good hermeneutics. Now, that's another big word for a Sunday morning. Good interpretation of what the Bible is saying it, it to us today. Because the Bible was written by people in a different era, in a different period. They were writing to people with a, with a specific um, purpose. And, and when we pick it up, we have to have good interpretation of what is being said. There's the bad interpretation as well of the Bible. That we pick it up and we just read whatever it says and we think... Why have I got to go and do that? We've got to use our minds. We need to use interpretive skills. I, I, I never heard, across, heard about this, folks, until I went to Bible college. I mean, I don't know. I'm not just meant to pick the Bible up. I mean, I've got to study it. Yes, you've got to study it. Yes, you've got to spend time to invest in it. Yes, you've got to put time away. You've got to turn Netflix off every few nights. You've got to spend time in the morning, open it up and ask God, to lead you. Another thing that's in there, in that statement of faith, that pillar of faith, is that the word, in the infallible word of God. In other words, folks, the Bible is trustworthy. The Bible's not out to deceive you. The Bible can be a complex book because it's got different styles of writing in it, but it's not out to deceive you. It can be trusted. God was not trying to manipulate things. God was not, the writers were not trying to manipulate things, but they were trying to write down what God was speaking to them. In that other one, folks, it said this, the Bible is our supreme and final authority in all matters of faith, in all matters of conduct. Can I say to you and I, this morning, 
When we believe that the Bible is the supreme authority for our lives, our Christian experience will go up a level. When we believe, folks, that this is the final authority on life, on this earth, as we know it, then our Christian experience and our faith will go up. We won't always understand it, but there will be a new level of trust, a new level of faith, a new level of stepping out of the boat and believing God. I don't understand it all. You don't understand a lot of things, folks, but you still believe them. There are a lot of principles and processes in life that you don't understand, but you still believe them. I don't know how I can connect on the internet with someone around the other side of the world, but I still do it and trust that it works. You're sitting there on your chairs, trusting that gravity will work, all right, and hold you to your chairs. You don't understand it. All I know is that there's a, a law in place in operation that I am being held down by gravity, and that will do for me. And folks, when it comes to God, we've got to step out in faith and say, I trust you. I trust what your word said is true. And folks, when we turn back to the Bible, when we go to the Bible, things go up a level in our Christian experience. I'm going to turn now to the Old Testament. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to a guy called Josiah. Josiah comes to the fore in 2 Kings chapter 22. Now, this is one of the darkest moments, darkest periods of Israel's history. When the people, the kings have turned away from God, they're doing their own thing, they're worshipping idols. And Josiah's, let me put that up on, hopefully there's a slide. There we go. There's, um, Josiah comes to the, the scene and, and he comes from just a horrific background. Josiah's grandfather was a guy called Manasseh. Manasseh is, if you like, all of the bad guys that you can imagine rolled into one. And he does terrible things to God in, in, in his time while he's ruling. He's the bad guy, but he's Josiah's grandfather. Josiah's father is, oh, did I wrote, write that down? Amon. Amon is king for a little while, but he gets assassinated. So his grandfather is about the worst king going. His father is assassinated. And Josiah becomes king when he's just eight years old. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a lot of, a lot of weight on a young guy's shoulders. And, and we talk about coming, having broken histories, folks. We talk about broken families and broken uh, generations. Listen, God used Josiah. He can use you. God used Josiah to turn a nation around. And let's read just for a little bit from 2 Kings 22. Skip down to verse 8. Because up until this point for the last um, few generations... The word of God, the Bible, God's spoken word, which was really Deuteronomy. The first few books of, books of the Bible were not even that, probably Deuteronomy. That was all the nation, nation of Israel had, but it hadn't been brought out for ages. Josiah comes to the throne, and we pick up in verse 8. It says this, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported it to him. Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. I want to talk about, just for a, a couple of minutes, the Bible being backstage in your life. The Bible was there. It was in the temple. It was just hidden. It had got dusty. It had been put on with other books, probably, and other important writings. It had been forgotten about. And they discover that this book was there all the time. And the king's helpers dig out this book and bring it to him. The book has been backstage in the life of the children of Israel, of God's people, for a long time. And I thought, wow, that, that's an incredible sign of perhaps how God's word is sometimes in our lives, and maybe in the life of our nation. You know how other priorities come in? 
How, how we just become busy with the routine things of life to sp rather than spend time in God's word, rather than prioritise reading what God says to us. We, we, we maybe just have other things to do. You know, we've got the kids to take to school. We've got, we've got things to do at work. We've got, we've got emails to send. We've got holidays to arrange. We've got uniforms to, to, to get ready. But you see, it was backstage. It was buried, but it was still precious to them. And God's people, folks, today... As Christians, we've got to be careful that we don't go the same way. That the Bible becomes a historic book of importance, but it's no longer part of our day-to-day -day walk with God. Because if we're not careful, education will push the Bible out. The media will push the Bible out, out of our lives. Politicians will push the Bible out of government. Secular humanism, folks, that is becoming more and more aggressive in our society, wants to, the, wants to have nothing to do with the Bible or Christianity. Digital consumerism, where we think we can get happiness by a few more buys on Amazon, or where we can get a few more likes online, or a few more views. We can put up words to the Bible on our walls, and I love that, I do that, we've got that in our house. But we've got to be careful that that doesn't become a substitute for spending daily time in God's word. We've got to be careful that just having nice platitudes about God's words or our favourite verses up, and don't actually spend time quiet and alone in God's presence, reading what he has to say to us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11 says... Give us our daily bread. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. We all know it pretty well. Give us our daily bread. And of course, Jesus was talking about our physical needs. But he was also talking about our spiritual needs as well. Bread in the Bible wasn't just about physical things that we eat. It was also about spiritual food that we need for our lives. And do you know what I've realised? When I don't have a meal at home... Or when I'm, I'm late for lunch or I'm late back home. Do you know what happens to me? I know, I'm sure this is no one else. Just me. But if, if I don't eat, I get grouchy. I really like that word, grouchy. Probably might sum me up a bit too well at times. But I, I get grouchy when I don't eat. I get weak when I don't eat. When I haven't had food. When, when I haven't had a drink in the morning. When I haven't had some coffee or something to eat. I get grouchy. And it's exactly the same in our walk with Jesus, folks. Unless we feed on spiritual food, we become weak. And we are easy picking for the enemy and the world. We need to be people who feed daily on this bread. But Josiah, so he, he was backstage in the people in, the, in, the, in Israel, backstage in their lives. But Josiah did something incredible. He didn't leave it backstage. He brought the word of God front stage. Front stage. And in chapter 23, next chapter on from where we were reading, verse 1, it says this. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been brought, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar, the pillar, the pillar. Here we go, and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep His commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul. Thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. As a leader, Josiah was modelling the word of God in his life. But the amazing thing is, it wasn't just for, for the leaders of the country. The word of God wasn't just for the ordained, it was for the ordinary. It was for the ordinary people. It was for the ordinary people to take encouragement from, to know where they were going, to know who they were, to know that God had a plan and a purpose for them. It was from Everyone and most of the people who were listening to the word of the Lord then, they wouldn't have had the literacy that we have today, they wouldn't have had the information that we do today. But they all listened not just the elite, but the ordinary. And the Bible was no longer backstage, the word of God was front stage. And I wonder this morning, folks, 
Is the Bible backstage in your life? If I'm honest, I think there are times that I would admit to you that I've not spent enough time in the Bible. We need the Bible to be front stage in our lives. No, I don't want to, don't want to say once again because maybe it never was. But I want to encourage you to bring it front stage in your life. You know, I, I've realised that if I'm going to do that, I've got to prioritise it. I've got to say no to certain things. I, I've got to say no to maybe watching this. I've got to say no to going that, and I've got to prioritise it. For me, the way this works is I, I like to get up early in the morning, and when all the whole rest of the house is quiet, I just spend time reading passages of the Bible. But not even then. It doesn't start first thing in the morning, because I know how grouchy it is that way really again. I can be first thing in the morning. It starts the previous night. The previous night, I open the Bible and I look where I was reading the night before, and I've got bookmarks. I open it up so that I'm there ready the next morning to read it straight away. I know how difficult it is to start habits. And if we want to start a new habit, we've got to do things to make it easy. If you want to start a new habit, make something really obvious. If you want to buy, read your Bible more, make it really obvious, like I do it in the morning, where it's just there and it's open, and I want to get into it. It's the first thing that I do. I, I turn other things off. I make sure my laptop's not nearby. My phone is off. The TV is definitely off. The kids are a million miles away. <laughs> well, they're only upstairs. I just spend time. And it's become a habit where I've been able to grow closer to God over years and years. Job says this, Job 23 verse 12, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. How did Job come through all those trials? How did Job manage to withstand the enemy invading his life and wreaking havoc on his family, his business, and his own personal body? He had stored up, treasured up the words of his mouth, of God's mouth. They were more necessary than food. Joshua, at the start of his kingship, said, well, it wasn't, well, well, at the start of his book, they didn't say that. Chapter 1, verse 8 said, This book of the Lord shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you will be able to make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Can I say, the more you get into God's word, the closer you feel to him. The more you spend time in God's word, the closer you feel to him. To God. I could go on, folks, but time has gone. I just want to ask you one question. It's not that. Don't worry about the seven tips. What's the most important thing that you can do every day? I want to say, I want to say to you this morning, the most important thing you can do is open up God's word. That might be a Bible like this. It might be an app on your phone. I'm not bothered. It might be a King James version. It might be an NIV version. It might be an ESRS, anything else version, NLT Amplified. I'm just worried. I'm just concerned that you get God's word into your heart and into your soul. And it becomes a pillar for your life. Let's stand to our feet. Heavenly Father, I hope what I've said today doesn't condemn people, doesn't make them feel guilty for maybe not prioritising your word, but I hope it moves them into a new habit for their life. Lord, I pray that you would help them this week to create a new habit of reading your word. And Lord, we know that it doesn't have to be long. You know, some people, they like to read long passages. Sometimes it's just a few verses each day. And that's the best way to start a new habit, folks. Something easy. Get it into your life. Lord, I'm asking that you would help people. Lord, I know they're busy. Lord, I know they've got so many demands on their life. Lord, I know that society tries to push the Bible out of their lives. And, and tries to push this book down, this holy book down. But Lord, we hold it dear. We hold it precious. Because we believe that it's your word to us. 
A law where it can't be scientifically proven. We know that that is not a, a reason to doubt the Bible. That is a re reason to believe God all the more because we have a God who can do what is scientifically impossible. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.